everything I've been reading has been like mercy, God's grace, and God's love for us. And that's been a great, like I didn't plan on doing this at all, but I'm going to like go off the books just a little bit. Um, last week I had the privilege of giving my first sermon ever, and it was <laughs> such a blessing because I, I got to give it to a bunch of men in our church and a bunch of elders of the church. And uh, Pastor Andy said, uh, Sailorville's term was tear down to build up, right? And that's the same thing in our church. We did the same thing. I got to practice giving a sermon to people who have given sermons and had a ton of experience, and they tore me down for sure. <laughs> I had never felt like that before. Like, I felt, I felt they said I did well, but then they pointed out all the things I could get better on, and I was so grateful for it. Uh, but if you guys could turn to Philippians 1, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7 would be great. And this was well, the passage I got to preach over, and it says, Is it right for me to feel this way about you all, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. And this next verse, verse 8, is really important. It says, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I feel the same way about the people that God has sent me. To, to minister to, you know, to all the college students, that the, to the college I want to minister to, uh, which is Grandview, the college I've been going to, to, to see why I'm passionate about it. But the word of, that Paul uses, um, affection, in verse 8, in the Greek, that word translates to splinkna. And that word essentially means, I don't know, this is going to sound crazy, but like if you were to say it to somebody, you'd be like, I love you with my bowels. <laughs> like, imagine going home to your wife and being like, hey, honey, I love you with my bowels. <laughs> Either you're going to sleep on the couch, get slapped, or she's not even going to know what you're talking about. But the term actually refers to, like, the inner soft tissues in you, right? Uh, it refers to, like, your organs, your core. Uh, like, when you have this kind of love, the idea is that your heart beats a little faster, uh, you breathe a little, little harder, a little lighter, shorter, and your stomach will like curl up into a ball when you think about these kinds of things, right? Well, it says Christ had this same kind of affection. It's, it's, it's a term that's described in the Greek as the strongest term for affection. And it refers to a love from your core, a love with every fiber of your being. And Christ had this love for us. And that's why he came, and that's why he died on the cross. Because he loved us so much that he, he came, and he saw that we were undeserving. He saw all of these things that we did. He saw that we were sinners. He saw that there was no way for us to get to heaven. And he gave us this way through him. And he came and died on the cross. And the reason for that was to show the magnitude and the riches of his grace. Amen. His unmerited favor that he's given us. And that's amazing that we've been all given this. But now if you could turn to Luke 10 to. So this has been a passage that has been part of my life as well. For the sole reason, once you read it, it kind of hits a little bit hard. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. It says, After the Lord appointed 72 others, and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was go about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his field, or into his harvest field. So there's so many people out there that don't know Christ. And that's, that's why I'm, I'm sharing this, is because I'm trying to set the, the idea of the need that is truly there for Christ. And I long to be a harvester, a laborer for Christ. Yeah. And that's why I'm here. Thank you. Whoops. Sorry. I need to hear the Well, so... <laughs> So we can. I am a part of a group called Campus Fellowship, which is a it's a college ministry group, and so I will be taking on the role of a resident at our church, 
And so that essentially, I'll get into my, like my role more later, but essentially I, my goal is to like reach new people, new college students, and I'll be working on Grand Views campus specifically. Uh, campus Fellowship is just like Salt Company, just like all these other things, but it's through our church, uh, Walnut Creek. But the point of this is that we get to reach Des Moines for Christ. There is four major schools in Des Moines, or three major schools in Des Moines. You have DMAC, Drake, and Grandview. And those three schools all have a campus fellowship on them, and they're all doing really well. And this, it's just amazing. We, we see that, oops, sorry. We see that like college is like the cutting edge of culture, right? And we know that in the darkness, there, there's no, there's all darkness on the college campus. And I'll get more into that later as well. But I, I know I grew up here, and some of you probably heard my story many times. You can see that's my, my family, awesome bunch of nephews now running around. I am the fun uncle. <laughs> I know. I get to be the human jungle gym, essentially. And it's, it's great. I absolutely love it. Um, but my story is that I grew up in a church like this, where I, I accepted, accepted Christ as a young, young, Christian, young adult kid, whatever, whatever you want to call it. As a young kid, I accepted Christ. But to me, it was just a get out of jail free card. It's like that Monopoly card you get. You go to jail and you just get out. That's all it was. I thought of it as assurance from hell. Nothing more. And the only reason I did it was to please my parents. You please your parents and that's it. And I heard the gospel hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. But my heart was so hard towards it that it never sunk in for me. And I, I know that this is the case for many, many, many other people. I can name, you'll see that there's two other men that were the same way as I was. Um, and it wasn't until so I went to college, Pastor Aaron told me, I came back for winter break, Pastor Aaron was like, hey, you should find a group of Christians that, like, are good, it'll be good for you, like, and I told him, yeah, sure, and not going to lie, my intentions when I told him that were straight up just, like, people pleaser kind of thing. Like I was not going to find a group. I did not have any desire to do any of that. But then I got to college, and I got invited by another person to go to Bible study with them. And I thought it was really weird that it happened twice. And I was like, well, if it happened twice, I thought I better go. <laughs> and I went, and I sat down in a diner with somebody. I, I, well, I went to Bible study, met, a, met this guy named Blake Joyner, now my roommate, now also my boss, which is great, like best friend is your boss and your roommate like you go crazy <laughs> um, but at the time he was like an hour late to like wherever we were meeting so I was like sitting in this diner in Des Moines for an hour just sitting alone and then he showed up and so when he finally showed up I was really mad at him already and then we got to talking and he's like oh what are your goals for life and I had like the American dream like good house good family good job like lots of money that's about it, right? You say that's about anybody, that's what it's going to be. And he looked at me and said, what if there's more to life than that? And then I told him, he was like, yeah, yeah, there is. There has to be. There has to be, right? And he said, then he shared the gospel with me. He shared that Jesus came and died for my sins, and he died in my place so that I could have a chance to go to heaven. And he shared that with me, and I, I, my first thought was, dude, I'm a Christian. You don't have to... You don't have to like say this to to me. And then I kind of I kind of did say that to him. And he looks at me and said, "I've seen the way you live. You're not a Christian." Because I got to college, and I'd idolized two things in my life, and it was football and my girlfriend at the time. And those two things got kicked out from under me really quick. I broke my leg, so football's idol got kicked out. And then right after that, my girlfriend broke up with me, and I was alone, and I had this pit in my life that I could not fill with anything. I tried to fill it with partying, I tried to fill it with drugs, alcohol, girls, nothing filled that void, because the only thing that could was Jesus. And so, Blake, this is the first time somebody in my life, well not the first time, but the first time my heart like responded to it, where Blake said that to me, and I was like, like, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. 
And I thought I was fine, which I really wasn't. <laughs> and I texted Pastor Aaron that night and asked him, I asked him, I was like, am I a Christian? Like, how do I know if I'm a Christian? <coughs> and then he told me, you should read the book of First John. So now we're going to turn to First John chapter 2. And that's First Peter. So First John chapter 2, um, three, four, 3 through 6, I think. Says this. I read the I read the book probably like twenty times that night because I was just searching for an answer. In these verses, says we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them, and this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And those three verses just sunk into my heart and my head. But I didn't do a thing about it. I kept living in sin. And those that sin just kept eating away at me. It went from something I enjoyed to this poison I was taking in. And so every time I would sin after that, those are the verses I would think of. The verse... Six specifically, it says, whoever claims to live as him, live in him, must live as Jesus did. So every time I would sin, I would see, I'm not living like Jesus. I'm not living like Jesus. And I knew that I wasn't a Christian from that point. And I held on for about a month after that. Until I absolutely had broken myself down with guilt and like sin and destruction. And then I'm sitting in church... And the sermon was on Second Peter. Honestly, could not tell you what was said. But at one point during the sermon, I just like white knuckle gripped the, like my legs or the chair or whatever. And I was like, I, I'm not a Christian and I have to give my life to Christ. And so we're standing there. The song, I Surrender, they sing it the last thing. And I started like breaking down in tears. And I grabbed Blake and we went into the church office. And we went through Galatians... 2, 19 through 20. Uh, sorry, I'm having you guys Bible on all of this. Even I don't have them open yet. Uh, but it says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live is in the body. I live by the faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside grace, the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And Blake read that to me, and I'm this blubbering mess still. I'm crying. Like I was crying. Like I don't think I've cried that hard ever, really. And he explained that I have to repent from my sin and I have to put my full faith in Jesus. And I have to crucify myself with Christ. I have to nail my sin to the cross with Christ. And I have to know that I, there's nothing I can do other than put my faith in Christ. Because if I could do anything, then Christ died for nothing. Then Blake and I have both prayed. And Blake prayed for me. And then I prayed and gave up everything. I told the Lord, take my life, take my money, take everything. Just Take it, use me, do what, do whatever you will. And then from there, I slowly, I actually read my Bible. I actually did all these things and actually became, was a Christian from there on out. And I slowly knew that if I did anything else in my life other than do what I'm doing now, I'll get to the end of my life and look back and see a wasted life. And so that's why I'm here. So that's my family, my story. But now let's talk about Grandview a little bit. Grandview has 1,700 students who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm very passionate about Grandview because I've been going to Grandview for three years now. And it, there's so many people there that just walk in sin and darkness and don't have any hope in their life. And it's very apparent. And this next... Uh, so the point of Campus Fellowship is to impact students for a lifetime. 
Um, that picture on the left, remember that picture on the left, the blue one that's kind of hard to see? I don't know if you guys can see it a little better on the TV. There's four men in that picture. That's myself. Blake is on the far left for you guys, too. Yeah. Blake's on the far left. That's the guy who led me to the Lord. And then it's Chris and Peter. All of us are roommates right now. But we were the only four guys in Campus Fellowship at the start of last summer. Um, but the, the point of Campus Fellowship is to impact students for a lifetime. But remember that picture of just four of us. So that I'll let you guys give some time on that Timothy Keller quote, essentially talking about how uh, the college campus is the cutting edge of culture. If you want to breed leaders of the church, you have to do it like when, when they're coming up in college. Um, but the need for, for campus fellowship and for Christ on campus is great. Obviously, we see that college students struggle with so many things like depression, drug abuse, sexual morality, and the biggest one is just separation from God. We see that there's no light in their world at all. You get to college, and darkness and sin is celebrated. And there's nothing that anybody, no, there's no light. Nobody, nobody preaches the gospel. Nobody does these things. And it's very apparent that Campus Fellowship is the only light on Grampy's campus. It's the only light on Drake, uh, Drake's campus. It's the only light on GMAX campus. And so the need is above and beyond just to have something there that is different than the culture. Um, this right here is my best friend now. His name is Brady. It's very ironic because my best friend from high school is also <laughs> named Brady. <laughs> And he came to the Lord this last fall. So he, he was the same story as I was, grew up in the church. He knew, knew the stuff. He knew all this. He came to college, got involved with us, and he slowly started changing. And at, at one point, he's sitting down in a coffee shop with Eric, another close friend of mine. And Eric looks at him and says, have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. He, like, avoided the question. Like, everything in him avoided that question. And Eric kept asking him. He kept like, did you make Jesus your Lord and Savior? Did you make Jesus your Lord and Savior? He was like, and eventually, one of, one of those times, he just looked at Brady and he's like, Brady, stop. Like, stop talking. Have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? And Brady also broke down in tears, just <laughs> like me. And he said, no. He said, no. And from that point on, he, he prayed with Eric, and he gave his life to the Lord. And from that point on, I've seen tremendous growth in this young man. And he's been such an encouragement to me uh, just because of his life. So here's the picture of the current campus fellowship. This was the Valentine's Day event. So for Valentine's Day, we, we uh, put a thing on. The guys cook and put a show on for all of the girls just to show how much we appreciate them. It's really fun. <laughs> we get to be dumb, we make stupid videos, the guys get to cook, and I was in charge of it though, this last year, and just about everything that could have gone wrong <laughs> went wrong. <laughs> like, we had this computer system that was hooked up, and then we had like crock pots plugged in, and somebody plugged one more crock pot in, and tripped the breaker, and everything went down. <laughs> And it took like two hours to fix everything. It was, it was hilarious, but it worked out. Um, as you can see, the back row is full of men. We went from that picture earlier of four men to a community of actual men. And that's, I'm obviously, I'm a little bit more passionate about the men in, in campus fellowship. I love my, my boys. But why are, why are we doing this? It's the gospel. The gospel is the biggest reason, biggest the biggest thing we are trying to push and spread in campus fellowship. Now, as you can see, the verse on the screen says, 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21, it says, he made, he made the one who knew, got, uh, sorry, it's hard to see from way back here. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And obviously, I've shared the gospel earlier, and it's been a huge part of my story, and it's been a huge part of many other people's story. Because it's the only way that it can be. And this is what Campus Fellowship is about. Making true and authentic disciples of Jesus Christ. Who love and worship Him in all that they do. So, we're also trying to make leaders for tomorrow's church. 
So we, we make leaders in in what we do just so that the the next generation of the church can have strong Christian leaders and strong strong uh, men and women in the church. And so this is Jesus' final commandment, the Great Commission. It says, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I will be with you until the end of, to, with you even till the end of the age. And as you heard earlier, one of our goals is to make authentic disciples of Jesus Christ, who love and worship him and all that they do. That's our church's mission statement. Also, Campus Fellowship's mission statement is to make true and authentic, authentic disciples. And that's Jesus' last command. So that's one of the, the biggest true things that we pursue. So here's just a picture of some of the things we do. Top left, we volunteer. Uh, the top right is Valentine's Day. Bottom right, it was a football game that everybody came to. Uh, but then just like odds and ends that people do together. Just having a community of other Christians in a college campus that is just really helpful. So this is our other, this is our like other saying, our mission statement as well. This is for Christ, for his church, for campus, and for culture. So we, we do everything for Christ and for his church to change the campus and to impact the culture. And that's, I have there are like shirts and stuff we have with all that. It's like everything we do is to change for Christ and just to impact the world is what our goal is. And this is kind of our, our ministry model. So you can see Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship of <laughs> to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So we have kind of four things that we do in general. We have midweek, which is like it's just like church, but it's for college campus. Like uh, Salt Company does their thing, and we do midweek. Uh, we have people like me and other pastors who go up and give sermons. And it's the point of it is to reach unbelievers for God's word. And that's like on a Thursday night, either on campus or at our church. Um, then you have church, which is like to spread God's word, and it's for the believer. You have Bible study, it's to bring God's people together with uh, believers and just to, to study the word together. And then we have like just hangouts, like time that we, we just get together and do fun things. Um, you have that's where God's people and unbelievers mesh the most. That's where you see people, new people every time. When you're like, oh hey, you should come eat food with us or come to this or go to the movies with us. Somebody new will be like, oh yeah, I love like the movies. Who doesn't love getting free food or something and on a college campus especially? And if that like a free sandwich or whatever or pancakes, like we make pancakes for people on campus all the time. Don't know why people love. Pancakes. But uh, if you do something like that and you give away free food and that opens the door, there's a proverb that says the gift makes way for the giver. And it opens up their heart just a little bit enough to hear the gospel. And it gives you just that chance to just share the gospel with somebody. And it's an amazing opportunity. So, like I said earlier, the church I'm through is Walnut Creek. Uh, Campus Fellowship is through Walnut Creek Church. We have several locations, and we're about to actually have another one in Rhode Island. We have a mission plant that's going to Rhode Island. It's insane. I'm really excited for that, too. Um, but here's what my role will be. So I disciple students, and I try to meet with, like, 10 to 15 students a week just to, like, try to pour into other students. Hopefully they eventually will start pouring into other students. Uh, like, the idea of multiplication is where I pour into students, and then they can pour into us students. And then I, it's... Like, allowing Christians to go from a new believer to a mature believer is the goal. Uh, I help plan events, like that Valentine's Day event. I help train leaders in, in college and at our church. And I'll also be preaching, not on, like, Saturdays, but at, like, midweek, that kind of thing, where I'll be preaching just, like, to um, kind of spread it out between me and a couple other guys and just to get God's Word out to... Hopefully, people who don't know Christ and to people who do know Christ. So, what motivates me? Like I said earlier, I'm really motivated by the guys. And the, you can see, like, the, the four men that we had last summer, all four of us are here. They're, we're in there somewhere. But there's four of us in there. 
and but now there's I don't know what is that I can't never counted it but it's almost double maybe almost triple of what it was just because of four faithful men that stayed and pushed and that itself is amazing and God has been working on Randy's campus and I, I, I'm so blessed and proud. Uh, but I can't do it alone the, one of the biggest things that happens is uh, I ask people to, to, to give money like monthly or even just like a one-time gift because then it frees me up. I don't have to work a full-time job then to be able to pour into students and stuff like that. Uh, I don't remember the story. You know, the story where Moses has to lift his hands to uh, for the Israelites to win the battle and he starts getting tired and lowering them and Aaron and Ur. Ur lift his hands up and hold him up because if he drops his arms, the Israelites are going to lose. Like, who's the winner there? Is it Israel? Is it Moses? Is it Aaron and Ur? No, it's everybody. Everybody there works together to accomplish, his, accomplish it, God's goal. So the biggest thing I can ask for is prayer. Um, I'll have a sign up for a prayer letter, but I think the biggest thing that any of you can do for me is just pray for me, and keep me in your prayers and your thoughts, because God works through prayers, you you are what you pray for, like, God will use that immensely, and it's, I couldn't ask for anything more, if you can't give anything or do anything, just pray for me, and I'll be blessed, uh, obviously I said monthly updates earlier, uh, but God uses that teamwork, whether it's prayer or monetary or whatever. It doesn't matter. God will use it. But the biggest thing is that I'm asking for is monthly support. So I'm, I'm going to just read this off. Uh, will you partner with me? I'm called by God to reach. I'm sorry, it's really small. <laughs> I'm called by God to reach those who need Christ or Jesus Christ. Campus Fellowship is dependent upon the generous gifts of others to empower its missionaries. I am responsible for raising 60% of my ongoing finances and resources for my work with the students in Des Moines. With your partnership, we can change the lives for the gospel. So, I'm trusting that God will provide team members, <coughs> people to be on my, my team, who will make monthly investments into this critical work. Would you prayerfully consider partnering with me in our campus ministry at one of these amounts? And it doesn't have to be any of those amounts. It can be whatever like amount you desire or you feel that God is leading you to. Um, I'll have a link if you, if you desire to give or would like to do anything with that. I have a link that you could use to, to give. And I also... I'm supposed to ask who else might be interested, but this is more for like a one-on-one -on -one thing, and I just forgot to take that out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, and that's just a, a cool picture of things. So thank you guys for allowing me to speak, and I'd just like to pray before, before we're done. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for just giving me this opportunity to speak, and thank you for just everyone being here and just listening to me and listening to the work that you've been doing in Des Moines, Lord, and just how blessed I've been to be a part of that, Lord. Uh, please just allow uh, this to be used, Lord, and allow whatever you will to be done, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. It is always fun to hear the testimony of what God does, and it's so cool to see how God draws over time. You know, you heard the gospel over and over and over again, but someone was loving enough to stick it to you and say, you're not living like it. You're not living like it. So that's why I challenge all of you to consider, do you truly live for Christ? Do you live like Christ? Has Christ really changed your life? And then I would encourage you, if you can support Mitch in any way via prayer or finances, that would be absolutely great. But today is communion, and I wanted to take just a little bit of time uh, now to look at Luke 22. So turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 22. I don't know about you kids, but growing up, I always went to church, and we always had communion, and I knew that I wasn't allowed to take it until I accepted Christ as my Savior, 
and then I was allowed to take it, but I didn't always understand all the importance of it, what was symbolized by it, and what was going on in communion. And so I just want to take a look at what we are celebrating today and hopefully allow us to pause and consider what God has done. And we're going to look at the Jesus who in Luke 22 is going to celebrate the Passover with his friends. He's in Jerusalem and Jerusalem swells to about a million people at that time. And look at what Jesus says to Peter and John in Luke 22 verses 7 through 13. He says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, or the Passover, which on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us to prepare it? And he said, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house in which he enters, and tell the master of the house, that The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room that's already furnished. Go and prepare it there. And they went and they found it just as Jesus has told him them. And they prepared the Passover. Now during the Passover, the Jews were reminded of their ancestors who lived in Egypt. And after nine plagues had already happened, do you remember what Jesus tells them to do or what God tells them to do? <laughs> He, was, he commanded Moses, and Moses commanded the people to take the lamb that was without spot and sacrifice it and eat it and spread the, door, uh, spread the blood where? On the doorpost, right? And when the angel of death came, what would he do to those who had the blood on their doorpost? He would pass over them, right? So you pass over them. So they're celebrating that the pure blood of the lamb that was spilled... They would take the impure blood of the people and protect it. And so in that, we already get a picture of Christ. So during that night, God set them free from their slavery and he loaded them with blessings. And I didn't realize until I was studying this book this week, but the calendar for the Jewish, the Jewish calendar changed on Passover day. Did you know that? The Jewish calendar changed on Passover day. Look at this verse. It says Exodus 12, 12, 12 2. This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. And this was the month of Passover. So what they're saying there is their life is completely changing. Their calendar is completely changing because of this Passover. Have any of you talked to someone who talked about their spiritual birthday? You ever told someone about your spiritual birthday? It's like, how old are you? I'm 70 years old, but I'm only 15 spiritually or whatever it is. And so this was kind of the spiritual birthday for the nation of Israel. And they celebrated what God had done. And each year the Jews would celebrate his great work. But look what Jesus says as he talks about it. And you notice if you have a, a kind of a, a heading on Luke 22, verse 14, it says the institution of the Lord's Supper. It says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This is the cup that is poured out for you in the new covenant of my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. So the first aspect of it is we see the body, if you're taking notes. The Passover, here in the Passover, the body of the Lamb was eaten. And Jesus that night took bread and broke it. And he said, this is my body. I am standing in the way as the sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a what? A body you have prepared for me. And so Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And each time we have communion, we celebrate that Christ's body, and we remember the body of Christ, it was real flesh and blood that died for us. That Christ literally, physically was there on the cross, and his body was crushed for us. But then we see the blood, 
On the Passover, the lamb was slain, and the blood covered the sins of all those who are in the house. But on his death, the doorpost was turned into a cross. The doorpost was turned into a cross, and Christ hung there, and he soaked, he drenched the cross with his blood. But the cruel thing about it, and I was thinking about this, so, oh, I didn't put the next note up there for you. There, the blood. The cool thing about the blood of Jesus Christ is in the Passover, what happens when the angel comes by, he passes over the sin. But look at what Christ's blood does. Oh man, I don't have a verse up there, sorry. The blood of Christ, it says in scripture, cleanses us from all sin. Do you remember that? It cleanses us from all sin. It doesn't just pass over your sin. It cleanses you from all sin. And there's those who will try to deceive you, tell you that there are multiple ways to heaven. But think about how many Egyptians were probably saying that before the Passover happened. Have you ever thought about that? How many Egyptians were like, there's no, don't worry about it. All the firstborn can't die. Like, what are they going to do? Break into our house? That's fine. All that you need to do is board up your house, get your machine guns out, and your firstborn will survive. And in the same way, I, I think that there are many who would tell us, even in today's day and age, you have to pray a prayer. You have to be baptized. You have to go through confirmation. You have to do all these different things. And that's how you're saved. There are multiple ways to heaven. God, going to heaven is like the spurs on a wheel. Or not the spurs. Spokes. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Spokes on a wheel. You know, the middle is heaven and you have all these different ways. No, that's not true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And in John 10, Jesus says, I am the door. I am the door. All who enter by me, they're the ones who are saved. But those who come on the other, they try. They are lost. And so the blood is absolutely essential because we have to realize when God looks at the cross, all the wrath of God is poured out for our sin and Christ cleanses us from sin. The wrath that we deserve is poured out on Christ. There are those, or you should think of it this way, I wrote down, there are no ladders into heaven. Only the blood of Christ. The blood slain door, stained door is there. But there's also the bitterness. The bitterness. It was interesting to me as I was looking through each one of the gospel accounts of the Last Supper. Do you know that the betrayal of Judas is in every single one of them? And as I thought about that, I realized that one aspect of the Passover meal was that they would eat bitter herbs. And look at these two verses. Tell me if there's not bitterness in them. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. And then later he said to Judas, what you are going to do, do it quickly. Do you think that Christ was completely unhurt or not hurt by Judas' betrayal? That would be, that's not, that's not even possible to think of it like that. He's sitting there and it, it said you have the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, Right there, who's passionate about Jesus, who wrote some of the best books in the New Testament, if you can say that, if you can qualify the Bible. And Judas right beside him. And Christ took the bitterness that we deserve. Have you guys ever heard the song, Jesus, Thank You? Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. I'm going to sing a solo. You ready for it? No. Uh, the Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy now seated at your table... There's a line in that song that says, He drank the bitter cup reserved for me. And Christ took our bitterness. But then there are benefits. The benefits of communion, or the benefits of what we celebrate with communion is, first of all, our sins are taken away. Our sins are taken away. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. And look at this. Where there is forgiveness of these, those sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. You see, in the Passover, sins were covered, and then each year you made offerings over and over again to remember how sinful you were. Have you ever thought about how fun that would be? You go to the priest, you offer another sacrifice, reminding you of all your sins. But with Christ, he cleanses us from all sins. It says in the scripture that Christ died once for all. 
When the wrath of God was poured out on him, his righteousness didn't cover our sins. It removed it. Think about that. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our sins, our iniquities. It says in Isaiah 53, Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are, what's the word? Healed. Not temporarily covered, we are healed. I know that some of you, well, I'll go this way. How many of you know what a placebo effect is? Right? That's when they, they give out a prescription and they give out a sugar pill that goes with it. And some people feel better with the sugar pill, don't they? There's an aspect where as I think about it, I, I would fit in the placebo group anytime. <laughs> um, if it's like, oh, I have a headache, and you're like, oh, here you go. This Tylenol will help you. It's just a sugar pill. I, I believe you. But what Tylenol does, one of the things I learned is Tylenol just covers your symptoms, doesn't it? It doesn't actually do any healing. And so often, that's what the Old Testament was. It was just covering. It was covering the sins. But on the cross, Jesus Christ said, it is what? It is finished. It's done. It's healed. So do you understand that your sins were taken away on the cross? If you trust in Christ as your Savior, you are healed through Christ. The curtain was torn and we now have peace with God. But another benefit of Christ's sacrifice when we received it is a new heart and new desires. And I just got to take a side note, talk about Mitch real quick. So Mitch texted me that night. How do I know I'm saved? Everything in me wanted to just tell him the answer. I was like, yeah, well, did you ask Christ? Did you receive Christ as your Savior? Are you trusting him for eternal life? And it's like the Holy Spirit said, don't tell him. <laughs> don't confirm something that you wondered because I remember thinking about him and I was looking at his life and I was like, I see no difference between the unbelievers he hangs out with and him, except that he comes to church on Sunday. I just didn't see a difference there. And so he told me later on, hey, I got saved. Um, it finally clicked and I was so excited and it was maybe two months, a month or two months after you had placed your faith in Christ and re repented of your sins and I don't know if I called you or texted you, but we're talking on the phone. I said, hey, have you been reading your Bible? He's like, yeah, I have. I'm like, what are you reading? He goes, Matthew 1. I'm like, do you guys know what Matthew 1 is? It's a genealogy. I'm like, well, this ought to be interesting. <laughs> so what are you learning from Matthew 1? And I was waiting for the Sunday school answer, Mitch. You know what he said? There's a whole bunch of different people, and they have a whole bunch of different pasts with a whole bunch of different problems, and God was able to use all of them for his good. And I'm like, whoa! New heart! <laughs> Someone's got a new heart and new desires that now when he opens the word of God, it's not, I'm just checking it off the list. It's, I get to hear from God and have him speak to me and give me life through his word. And so there's a new heart, there's new desires. And listen, when you come to know Christ as your savior, there's a new affection. And that's why we constantly point back to you is there an affection for God, a love for God, a change in your desires, or do you just have the same American dream that all your unbelieving friends have? Do you look exactly like the people around you, or is there a new desire? It's really interesting. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that communion is applicational. He says, we eat bread without leaven, which represents sin, as a reminder of 1 Corinthians 5, which says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. As what? You're already unleavened. Have you ever thought about that sentence? What he's saying is, you're already unleavened. It means the sin is already taken care of, but cleanse out the leaven. What he's talking about is, now that you have Christ and you've been born again, and your sins have been removed, start living like it. Turn away from sin. Turn towards Christ. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, celebrate communion, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Ask yourself this question. Is your relationship with God sincere and truthful, or is it just fake? Is there a genuineness there? Is there a desire to turn from sin, a desire to turn towards Christ? But the challenge to evaluate ourselves and then cleanse out the old leaven or the sin was often a discouraging one to me because I just imagined, well, we now have a container for flour. And we have flour in a big container, and yeast is leaven. Okay? So if you don't know that, I'll just talk to the kids. Everyone who's cooked knows that yeast is leaven. 
<laughs> and yeast is tiny. And I did, when, I, when, you, when I read that verse, I thought, okay, imagine if your life is a container of flour. And someone comes in with a cup of yeast and dumps it in there and shakes it up. And they go, okay, now remove all the leaven. <laughs> like, I can't do that. And that's where we go back to, did you save yourself? Do you sanctify yourself? God does that work. So once again, we turn our minds as Christians, we have to go back to, it's not just about do this, do this, do, don't do this. It's going, Christ, you have to cleanse out the leaven in you. You're the one who sees it. And we turn with new heart and new desire. So rely on the Holy Spirit. The strength you need to kill is not your own, but it's found in the helper who Jesus sent, who is the Holy Spirit. Finally, we get a future hope. The, as I thought about the Passover and what Jesus is celebrating, there are three main meals, if you would, in Scripture. You have the Passover, the Lord's Supper, and the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And I thought about it this way. How long is eternity? Forever, okay? How long is this life according to Scripture? A vapor. A, a mist that appears for a little while and, and passes away. If you are married, that's probably about how your ceremony feels in comparison to your marriage. Your ceremony was a vapor. Ours was 23 minutes, I think it was. But think about the Passover as God's proposal. Because it looked ahead to Christ, the Passover lamb, correct? And then you have the Passover lamb who removes our sin, but it looks ahead to to the marriage supper of the Lamb where we'll spend eternity with God. And it challenged me to think about this. I uh, I forget what we were watching. It was on Disney+. Plus, But basically, we found out that if you want to get married at Disney in Cinderella's castle, have the perf picture-perfect castle, or pi picture-perfect wedding, and you want to get married in Cinderella's castle, one, you have to do it at night after the place is closed. Two, the fee is $75,000. If you would like a carriage ride, it's an additional $15,000. Do any of you know someone who spent an exorbitant amount on a wedding? Is that the right word? A big amount? <laughs> we use words that I know. A big amount on the wedding? Do you know people spend so much money on the wedding and often spend so little time on the marriage. Think about that for your own life. This is not all there is. Don't spend all your life invested here. We look forward to a future hope. Look, go to uh, go to Revelation nineteen. Revelation nineteen. I'll read this, and then we will partake of communion. I want you to think about those these three points. Our sins are taken away. We have a new heart, a new desire, and a future hope. Revelation 19, starting in verse 6. Talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And His bride has made herself ready. Guys, we are in the prep time for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The bride is making herself ready. It says it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. As we celebrate the Christian's meal, consider these three questions. Is the blood of Christ on your doorpost? Have your sins been taken away? Or have you just tried to get your get out of hell free card? Secondly, consider, is there leaven that needs to be removed by the Spirit? Do you know you're living in sin? 
Because you know it, don't you? You know the sins that are going on in your life. Is there sin that you know you need to confess and ask the Spirit to remove? And then are you looking forward to the hope of being united with Christ for eternity? It says in Scripture, everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. So don't be caught up in just the wedding and forget the marriage that is to come where we will spend eternity with Christ. We're going to have the deacons come and then we will receive the bread and juice today. Father God, we get to celebrate this meal and so often we just go through the motions of taking it and not evaluating. Would you use your spirit to convict us of sin? Please forgive us for the sins that so easily beset us. Just the, the idea of we get so focused on the here and now and we forget the future that one day we will be with you forever. May we learn to live with that eternal perspective. It will teach us to be way more kind and compassionate to each other. It will give us greater boldness for trusting you when the trials come. It will help us even understand when our finances are gone, when things aren't going well. And we say, you know what? This is not all there is. But God, you've got to take your spirit. Thank you for how you drew Mitch. And maybe you're drawing someone right now that says, man, I know I'm not actually saved. I'm, I'll fight till I'm blue in the face and say that I am. But no, nope, my heart longs for all the things of this world. I live just like an unbeliever, except that I come to church and I put on my good church face. God, would you draw them and open their eyes, set them free from their sin and their bondage. If there are those here who are trapped in the sin right now and it's coming to their mind, it's in the forefront of their mind, set them free. Use your spirit to pull out that leaven and may we be preparing ourselves as the bride of Christ through the righteous deeds that we do. Not out of duty, but out of delight. Thank you for your body, which was given for us, and your blood that was shed for us. Let it be a motivation to us to trust in you. May we not try to enter by our prayer, by our actions, but by Christ alone. Thank you, Christ, for dying for us. And that we get to celebrate this each month. Would you, Lord, forgive me for how many times I've just gone through the motions of communion. Help me to lead well. Even as we partake of this each week, the Lord's Supper, we probably should just start by calling it the Lord's Supper instead of calling it communion. The Lord's Supper, we're reminded of what Christ did. Give us a sense of realism as we realize you handed, Jesus, you handed your disciples the bread and you said, this is my body. You handed them the wine and said, this is my blood. I am the Passover lamb. I am entering in as the spotless lamb of God who will be slain for spotted people. Thank you, Christ. Thank you, God, for your love for us. In Jesus' name.